The King slash Royals organization has a long and complicated history. Only the Washington franchise has relocated as many times. And if not for a last-minute deal struck by the current ownership group, the King's nomadic journey would have added Seattle to its list of hometowns. Instead, Brown has broken out a new arena, and the team has a star in the making in DeMarcus Cousins. So the only thing headed north these days is the Kings' winning percentage. Vince Cellini recalls the evolution of a team that is 65 years and more than 2,600 miles in the making. The Kings began as the Rochester Royals and in 1949 became one of 17 charter members of the newly formed National Basketball Association. Success came early to the Royals. In their third season, led by point guard Red Holtzman and top scorer Arnie Risen, Rochester beat the New York Knicks in seven games, claiming the 1951 NBA title, the one and only championship in team history. The Royals moved to Cincinnati in 1957, but their Rochester success did not travel. Being lousy helped the Royals land a territorial pick prior to the 1960 season, and that pick was University of Cincinnati star Oscar Robertson. And the Big O nearly averaged a triple-double during his rookie campaign. In 1962, Ohio State star Jerry Lucas joined Robertson in Cincinnati to help trigger a run of six straight playoff appearances. As 1970 rolled around, Ex-Celtic great Bob Cousy took over as head coach. And not surprisingly, the Royals adopted a Boston-like fast-break style. Cincinnati sure could score, but so could the opposition, and the Royals failed to punch a ticket to postseason. In fact, they would not reach the playoffs again until the mid-70s, an eight-year drought. By 1972, the club was sold for $5 million to a group from Kansas City, and the team name was changed to Kings. Standout players included Cincinnati holdover Tiny Archibald, who in 1973 became the first player in NBA history to lead the league in both scoring and assists in the same season. The Kings reached the California Capitol in 1985. Purchase price? Ten and a half million dollars. Ex-Chicago Bull Reggie Theus brought style and scoring to Sacramento. He always had that good hair. But the victories were few. Starting in 1986, and over an eight-year span, the Kings averaged just over 26 wins a season. Those were the lost years. There was Bill Russell, hired and then dismissed as head coach, and botched NBA drafts, like taking Arkansas's Joe Klein sixth overall in 1985, with players like Chris Mullen and Carl Malone on the board. Four years later, in 1989, they selected Louisville's Purvis Ellison number one overall. He was a king for all of 34 games. However, a decade later, Chris Weber, Vladi Divac, Peja Stojakovic, Jason Williams, and Mike Bibby made the Kings a must-watch team with spectacular passing and dunks. The 2002 Conference Finals with the Lakers remains one of the all-time great series in league history. Leading Los Angeles two games to one, it took Robert Morey's miracle three to win game four and the Kings would eventually bow in seven games. Fast forward to a Kings team that hasn't been to the playoffs since 2006, but one that includes a big man on the brink of all-star status and a wing scorer who may help Sacramento make that long battle to keep the franchise in town well worth the fight. Great job by Vince with that piece, and the Kings are off to a 6-4 and four start, which is by far their best over the last five years, as you can see. And in fact, it's the first time the Kings have been over 500 through three games since the 2004-2005 season. We will be asking their owner, Vivek Ranadive, about that later on in our show as we grind towards the Van Dyke game presented by Sprint, which is coming your way from Sacramento. The Kings hosting the Pelicans, Cousins versus Davis, and it should be a very entertaining game. Rick Hamill, Steve Smith, Isaiah Thomas, welcoming, welcoming you back to game time. And both of you played, uh, I'm assuming, uh, Isaiah, you played at Arco Arena. Yes, I did. Um, and, and I know you did, Smitty. Talk to me about the environment there. Uh, was it as hostile, or is it as hostile as it looks from, uh, you know, a sea watching on TV? I mean, when they were going, see, we have days, uh, you talking about the Kyle Bells, you talking about the screaming, <laughs> you talking about, I mean, it was epic, the noise there. I mean, and also, they were putting on a show. You talking about moving the basketball, spreading the court, shooting the threes, the Sacramento Kings 
we talk about it now, but they were before their time. And then you still had Webb who could play at the elbow and also could then pound you downstairs and, and post up and dunk the basketball and rebound with those big old hands. So <laughs> it was a great plan against him, that environment. I love that type of environment because it kind of gets you going, but sometimes it was a factor and an edge to them because you couldn't hear a call out yeah, plays yeah. to some of your teammates. The, and that's the thing you remember most is the, is the fans and the, the cowbells. I mean, it, it was it was so loud and they they would be hitting that bell and, and you know, I'm we city boys, you know, we, <laughs> we're, we're not used to that, that bell ringing that loud in the arena and it, and it was just going and the fans would get to going and you really couldn't hear yourself calling the play, you couldn't communicate with the coach, you had to do a lot of stuff with hand signals, and, you know, they, they would have it going. And uh, what, what Chris Weber and what Vladi did for the Sacramento Kings and that organization in that town, as you can see, they were a team that was always moving around. They were kind of nomads. But what Chris Weber and Vladi and those guys did, they gave them a solid foundation, and they gave them stability to build upon from you know, and, and where they are now. And, you know, we have to give Coach Malone a lot of credit. You know, we talk about cousins, we talk about gay, but they were kind of, you know, they, they, they were kind of, you know, we weren't sure about gay, we weren't sure about cousins. But this coach, this young coach, Mike Malone, has done a great job with some very tough characters on his roster. A tough locker room, a maturing cousins, a superstar, not superstar yet, and gay, balancing all of that. I mean, he's brought it all together, and he's got them off to a good start. He comes from a great coaching family, uh, you know, so my hat's off to him. He's done a great job, and whenever the players are doing good, that means that they're being coached well, and right now, Cousins and Gay are being coached extremely well. Sweetie, do you think that, that Malone is doing a better job, you know, with managing the, the, the egos and the personalities and that kind of stuff? Or is it the schemes that he's running and, and the X's and O's that you see on the court? I'm with Isaiah. I mean, he's always had that X's and O's, and that's one part of the NBA. But like Isaiah just said, you talk about a different type of locker room. You know, there's some guys that... Want to be the man, don't know how to be the man. There's some balls of guys, there's some personalities. Let's also throw in are we standing Sacramento? Are yeah. we leaving? Yeah, you know, everything going around that team, whenever they get sold. And then I think right now is his internal team is starting to wear on these guys, they're starting to trust him. And I think also with a little bit of help, I think you always got to have those solid veterans coming off the bench the Kyle Landry's, the Ramon Sessions. The tough guys. I, I even like Ryan Hollins because you can see he will battle cousins in practice, and I think that's where your teams are made. You have the starters. They need that second team to push them. They have a second team right now to push them every day. That's how you get better. Formerly known as Arco Arena, now Sleep Train Arena is the site of tonight's fan night game presented by Sprint. The Kings hosting the Pelicans. It's a four-game Tuesday night, and it is time for a break here on Game Time.